Welcome, welcome, welcome back, my Be Health Empowered family. Thank you so much for joining us here on Excuse Me, Doctor. I, of course, am Dr. Melissa Clark. I'm here with you every week. Please call me Dr. Mel. We bring you Excuse Me, Doctor, specifically so that you can have the health information that you need to make empowered health decisions for yourself, your family, and even your community. So thank you so much for tuning in, whether you're listening on Facebook, whether you're listening on YouTube, whether you're joining us on HURXM 141, HUR Voices XM 141, regardless of where you're joining us, thanks for tuning in. If you're on social media though, please hit us on YouTube with a subscribe and on Facebook with a like. I really, really, really appreciate you for that. And of course, I really want you to put those questions in the chat, questions, comments. We want to hear from you. That's the whole reason why we're here is to make sure that you are part of our discussion with whatever we're covering. So let's just get right into it. And of course, you know, I have to have my fantastic co-host, Tonight with me, Mr. Wayne Bruce. Hey, Yay! Wayne. Where, where is my <laughs> applause? Where is the applause, folks? <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. There me you holding go. it down tonight, folks. It's just me holding it down. Yeah, yeah. We gotta, we gotta somehow make it without Bria tonight. But we'll um, make it without her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's gonna be good though. It's gonna be good, and we we we're sending her a shout out wherever she sending is. Sending her a shout out, Doctor Mel. Tonight's show, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited every show, right? Yeah. Every show, I'm excited, but I'm excited to be supportive tonight. I'm so, okay. I'm okay. I'm like a true supporter. I, I mean, I'm so supportive that I got on my supportive hoodie tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> So whatever, whatever that, that, whatever that hoodie means, I don't know, but you know, it's we a, are talking about what, what does it, it mean? It, it, it's a comfort hoodie. Okay, it's for comforting. Comfort. You know, we're going to talk about some things, some issues with women, but yes. I'm here to comfort you guys. And, and also <laughs> to make okay. sure that everybody in our listening audience can get their questions in. So absolutely. As you always do, bring it, bringing the word in from the street. So That's what I do, yeah. And tonight, you kind of alluded to it, but we're talking about uh, women and the specific effects of alcohol on women, which don't really get talked about a whole lot. I mean, you know, we hear about a little wine is good for the stomach. You know, does that really mean everybody? I don't know. Is drinking different from men and women? Right. Um, you know. We got wine clubs. We got moms who wind down. We got Hoda and Jenna on on the Today Show. In the morning. You know, with their, in the, in They're the on morning. at 10 o'clock. They're on at 10 o'clock with drinks. Exactly. Or talking Actually, about even earlier, earlier in the other time zones. So, yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, you know, for you guys, is for, for women, that is, it, it, it is set up for you to kind of drink more. I mean, guys, we drink around events and we will go out and say, let's have a drink. But you, we don't have, we don't have, uh, you don't have wine clubs. We don't have wine clubs. <laughs> it's not many well, when let's go to the wine club event just well, for men. Well, we're going to cover it. Is it, is it harmless fun? Right. Or right. are there some things that we also need to know about the health effects specifically mm -hmm. for women? So we're going to cover that tonight. We have an incredible guest who wrote a book called On the Rock, Straight Talk About Women and Alcohol. So right. we're going to be bringing on her on later on in the show. So stay tuned and share, share, share with all the women who you know, who you think should have this information. Share the episode, folks. This is going yep. to be good. And, it, and, and whether you're a man or a woman, everybody can get, gain something from, absolutely. from the knowledge that, of uh, our guest this evening. So, you know, absolutely. Dr. It's going to be good. Come on here and do her thing. But before she does, we have to recap the top news in health and wellness. There we go. With the recap. You know, with the recap. There we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I knew we were going to get our graphic up. There we go. Everything. Dr. Mel, this is the first recap that does not include COVID. 
Because Bria's I'm, not here. Bria's not here. <laughs> why? We don't even want to say why. But look, I'm excited because we're talking about overall wellness. And, you know, uh, everybody's dropping weight. And I've dropped a few. 30, you have. 30 to be exact. Uh, but I've dropped but a few. But who's counting? But who's no, counting? That's, that, who's, that is wonderful. Let me just say that is fantastic. I mean, it's what we do. We drop weight. Anyway, but here's the deal. I I I got a sweetener the other day and it said monk fruit with this other sweetener. I thought it was great and been using it. And uh and then this <laughs> comes out. It's I couldn't even pronounce it. You had to pronounce it for me. Erythritol. It's, it's erythritol. Yes, and yes. So erythritol or no? So maybe it's not so good. So this is the deal. Okay. So um, it's th that's the art name of the artificial sweetener. It's in a bunch of sugar-free, low-cal products like sodas, ice cream, and health drinks because it does not raise your blood sugar, right? Um, I don't know if you've seen buy antioxidant drinks um, like in Whole Foods and stuff like that. That's where right. the prominent brand is in. And our body actually produces it in small amounts. It's a it's a sugar alcohol or a sugar okay. uh, alcohol sugar, right? Um, but it's being added to processed foods a thousand times higher uh, volumes than it's made in our body, right? Wow. And it turns out that that huge amount is not so good. It seems like studies are showing that it's associated with a higher risk of heart attack stroke blood clotting and death so not right, good news for it. We, we can't even lose weight without the fear of blood clotting stroke and death i mean <coughs> well what what are, what are the, we going to come to i mean what well are, i think you know you mentioned monk fruit monk fruit is a naturally occurring it, it it's comes from a fruit and it also does not raise blood sugar. It's not manufactured in a lab. So, you know, one thing I did was I just, you know, got rid of the monk fruit with the eth uh, erythritol okay. and just stuck with the monk fruit, right? Okay. Um, right? Or instead of stevia, you know, with the erythritol, just stick with the stevia. So, right. um, you know, so, those are some other options. So what you're saying in essence that we need, it's more important to read the labels. Of yes. Anything. Exactly. Read the labels. If it has artificial sweetener in it, I'd probably stay away from it until more research comes out showing that it is safe. Right. OK, because there hasn't really been these long term studies and this information is just kind of coming out. So probably okay. a good idea to to stay away from it for now. OK, so look. So is real sugar better? That's what everybody wants to know. Is real sugar better for you than the erythritols yeah. or the, you know, the different substances, yeah, sucralose so, and those things. It depends where the sugar is coming from. That's the honest answer. So, study shows that free sugar, so sugar that's like that you add, you know, from the packet or whatever, added sugars or sugars that are in fruit juice, syrups, and honey, mm -hmm. those are not good for you. They they are also linked with a higher risk of heart disease and stroke. OK, but if you consume the same amount of calories from ca carbohydrates that are not free sugars, so that's mm -hmm. sugars that occur naturally in fruit. So if you eat the whole fruit and not the fruit juice, mm -hmm. if they're in vegetables like sweet potatoes, grains like brown rice, dairy products like milk, you get the exact opposite effect. You get less heart disease and stroke. And that's because of the fiber in the food that slows down the absorption of sugar and allows it to pass through your body more easily and not give your body these sugar spikes. So, you know, basically don't add sugar in. If you're going to get your sugar, get it from your, from the food that you eat and don't drink it either in fruit juice. You see this face? <laughs> <laughs> I do. This it doesn't face. look like a happy face. It this does is not look like a happy face. Disappointment. Disappointment. Yeah. yeah struggle. I think, yeah. Yeah. I can't. I basically you have to drink water. Yeah. And that's it. Water. Yeah. 
water is the best drink of all. It is. And we are 70% water. So we should constantly be trying to replenish the water in our body. So it seems, so let's keep down the road because, uh, yes, I am. Yes. I'm speechless for the first time. (laughs) (laughs) I'm speechless for the first time and I'm going to give it up to my sister, Pam, Pam in the audience. She says, Wayne is speechless for the first time. I am first time ever, ever. (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not doing well here, so let's well, let's let's go let's go. We, we're steaming down the same road, like. Uh-huh. So the great thing is, mm-hmm. cutting calories can help you with the the rate we age. Is that true? Yeah, there's a new study that showed that cutting calories by 25 percent slow down the pace of aging in young and middle aged adults. So starting early, um by a few percentage points, like two to three percent. But actually, previous work shows that that two to to three percent slower aging actually is associated with a 10 to 15 percent lower risk of dying over about a 10 year period. So that's pretty significant. And it's the the first time they've actually shown this in humans. They've shown it in 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 animal studies before. Mm -hmm. Um, So we we know more research is needed. But we know that one way that people are already cutting calories is through intermittent fasting. So you know all about that, right? Hey, start at noon. Breakfast. Okay. That that whole thing. So they're saying the whole thing about breakfast is the most important meal of the day was really started by the Kellogg's to get you to eat the cornflakes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying uh, you didn't hear from me. It's all about money in the land of milk and honey. Hey, <laughs> and you brought up honey. See, I can't even eat yeah. honey anymore. Um, I'm oh, sorry. Dr. I'm Miller. sorry. So yeah, but I, but you you eat limit. breakfast at you you eat your first meal of the day at twelve and yeah, and that's one way that you've lost weight, right? You limit you time limit the when you can eat during the day, and that automatically right. cuts calories because right. you know you're only eating in certain times, and right. that's been pretty effective for a lot of people. Well. Not not for not for the entire United States, because we have we're number one. We're number one, Dr. Mel. We're number yeah. one as the unhealthiest, wealthy nation on Earth. How's this is not a medal. This is not a medal that we want. Right. So right. this was a study done by the Commonwealth Foundation. It showed that the U.S. spends dramatically more on healthcare than any other high income nation, but we have the worst health outcomes by nearly every metric. It's ridiculous. Wow. So people just can't afford healthcare, I guess, in the United States. Does that guarantee, but health coverage doesn't guarantee good health, does it? It, it doesn't, but we're the only ones who don't provide universal access to healthcare okay. of these high income nations. And so what's basically happening is we're living shorter, less healthier lives without people actually accessing the healthcare system when they need it. Um, and for example, we have the fewest annual healthcare visits, um, 30%. So one in three people have two or more chronic diseases. We have the worst rates for life expectancy, avoidable deaths, infant and maternal mortality, and chronic diseases like obesity. So what can be done? What can we do? Yeah. Well, you know, it's 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 a policy issue on one level, like things that ha- increase access to health care, things that improve our environment um, and our living conditions, investing in health equity and social services, and things that we know lead to a healthier population. It's deciding to spend our money in that way as opposed to, on end of life care and lots of money, you know, at, at the end of life, spend it more at the beginning of life to give people a uh, more healthier, op- more, op- more options, more opportunities mm-hmm. to stay healthy throughout their lifetime. Wow. That that's great advice. I mean, because we will spend, Americans will spend on a funeral. You'll go yeah. in debt. Americans will go in debt on funeral costs, yeah. <laughs> but won't that's spend true. on on, on their health to right. have a beautiful life while you're here. Yeah. So uh, let's lose the number one. I mean, I like being first, but not not there. Yeah, not for that. 
Yeah. Not for that. Definitely not, not for, for that. that. So you do know what time it is, right? You um, do know. No, remind me. The weekly debunk. It's debunk time. Stop it. This information in this track. So we're going to bring up one of the Twitter finger members, Taylor Twitter finger. She's younger. She says she hit me up. She says my friend who is pregnant posted a living will on TikTok because Taylor uses TikTok. Yeah. Begging doctors, if there are complications during childbirth, save me before the baby. She said, is that necessary? She wanted me to ask you that. I said, I don't yeah. know. Let me ask well, the doctor. Apparently, there's just been this big wave of people posting these living wills on TikTok that say that. And it's not really necessary to post that um, because it rarely ever comes down to you know, saving the mother over the baby and vice versa. That happens a lot in the movies or on soap operas, but not really so much in real life. There might be a need to do an emergency C-section, for example, to help the baby if the baby gets in distress or there's difficulty during the birthing process, or the mom might need an emergency hysterectomy, removal of the uterus if there's excessive bleeding. But it really happens that it's like choosing the mom over the baby. Um, but let's talk about why women are feeling the need to post this. In states that have restrictive abortion laws, some women are fearful that doctors are going to prioritize the life of the baby um, oh. over over their unborn over them in a medical emergency. And we know that you know more than a dozen states, mainly in the South and the Midwest, have banned or severely reduced restricted access to abortions following the Supreme Court's decision about eight months ago or so now to strike down Roe versus Wade and basically leave it up to the states. Um, so we know that pregnancy is not a harmless condition and the risk of death has been increasing in the past few years uh, and the risk of complications. It's been happening the fastest among African-American moms. We know that who are dying at three times the rate of white moms and the pandemic actually accelerated uh, the number of Hispanic moms who now uh, previously were on par around the rate that white moms, uh, white pregnant moms died. But that's been accelerated by the pandemic differentially for, for Hispanic moms. So, you know, people have these fears and that's, I think the reason why they're posting these living wills, but know that they're not, um, you know, that they're, they're not necessary. It's more important to develop a great relationship with your doctor, keep your prenatal care appointments, um, focus on healthy eating before you even get pregnant and uh, maintain that during your pregnancy. Uh, we talked all last week, right, about doulas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and the great uh, role that they are playing now. So there are lots of different things that you can do to enhance your opportunity for a healthy pregnancy far and away most pregnancies are healthy so um yeah it's no need to to post the living wells wow so taylor stay off tiktok no need <laughs> no need to do that she could be on that for other reasons but okay well right, thank Dr. you Mill. All right, we'll see you back in a little bit. We are going to move into our show for tonight. So, you know, we've seen the movies Girls Trip, Girls Night, Sex in the City that associate women drinking alcohol uh, and, and make it sort of normalized. But are there health concerns that we as women should be aware of when it comes to drinking? Well, as part of our Women's History Month empowerment series for the month of March, it is Women's History Month, uh, we are going to be talking tonight with Dr. Susan D. Stewart, who is the author of On the Rock, Straight Talk About Women and Drinking. She is a professor of sociology at Iowa State University, and she focuses in her research on gender, families, and women's health. And she's written numerous articles and books, including the one that you just saw. So welcome, Dr. Stewart. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Absolutely. And I should mention you were on Dr. Phil recently, right? I was. It was on uh, January 10th. All mm -hmm. right. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's jump right into it. Tell us about the trends that we're seeing 
when it comes to alcohol cons consumption in America, especially as it pertains to women? Mm -hmm. Okay. So about two thirds of the population drinks alcohol, currently drinks alcohol. Men's use of alcohol has remained pretty stable over the last decades, but it's women's use of alcohol that has been increasing. So now their levels of alcohol use have converged largely. So women are only like nine percentage points less um, in terms of, you know, do they currently drink alcohol or not? Or I think it's, did you drink alcohol in the last 30 days? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. So that's, that's good to know. And it kind of, you, you mentioned women's alcohol consumption has been going up. What are some of the factors that are associated with that? I think I alluded to some of it when I talked about, you know, kind of in the media, the sort of the normalization of, of alcohol consumption for women, but are there other factors too? Yeah. Um, it's sort of akin to smoking in the 60s and 70s. As women move into male spaces, they tend to adopt, unfortunately, the poor health behaviors <laughs> of men. And I think yeah. um, it's kind of like trying to be one of the boys or, you know, work actually involves a lot of alcohol in many industries. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. There's also this normalization of alcohol. We see it everywhere. You, you go to yoga class and there's a, a yoga and wine. I just saw this in my own town. Yoga oh. and wine. <laughs> so, um, and the movies and the marketing. I and mean, if you go to the grocery store, you see just shelves mm -hmm. and shelves of alcohol uh, directly marketed to women with the fancy mm -hmm. labels and the names, you know, the middle sister and the mad housewife and those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't heard of that one. The mad housewife. That's a new one. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know, with, with women also, you know, during the pandemic, um, staying at home, you mentioned the workplace culture, but, but did the, did the pandemic also affect alcohol consumption patterns as well? Absolutely. So everyone's drinking more and we don't yet know whether those love it's going to level off and then decline and go back to pre pandemic levels. It doesn't look like it yet. Mm -hmm. So yeah. for both men and women and more alcohol is being consumed um, in the home and during the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And women generally are the ones that consume alcohol in the home. Okay. Interesting. So um, kind of to Wayne's point uh, earlier, <laughs> uh, I think he mentioned men don't have wine clubs. Um, so, so if we're talking about, you know, this increase in alcohol consumption among women, you know, what's the harm? I mean, you know, the Bible says a little wine is good for the stomach, right? What, what's the, what's the big deal? Why did you write the book? Um, about straight talk about women and alcohol? Yeah, why I wrote the book, um, in my demographic, there's a lot of drinking um, and we have kids and we go to book club and you know, then you see these movies. And if you're on Facebook and you're part of like, oh, these moms groups and things, there's lots of memes kind of making light of alcohol use or you go to the store and greeting cards and dish towels and, sign you put on your wall. And I was like, what as a sociologist, what is going on? Because mm -hmm. then when you look at the data, you see increased deaths to, um, uh, among women to, um, like mm, cirrhosis and alcohol related liver disease. Um, we've seen a leveling off of life expectancy of men and women. And that is in part due to alcohol, alcohol control to car accidents and suicides and opioid overdoses. And um, it's associated with um, uh, child neglect and abuse, wow. um, in addition to the negative health effects on women themselves in terms of increasing risks, you know, like heart disease, cancer, stroke, like all of those things, mm -hmm. and obesity. Um, yeah. And yeah. depression. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and, and you said cancer, specifically breast cancer too, right? That's right. And yeah. you know, what tells me is some of these wine companies, they will market themselves, um, as 
you know, uh, uh, with pink ribbons and things, even yeah. though there's a direct link between alcohol consumption, heavier alcohol consumption and breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So is there, is there a safe amount of alcohol to drink? Like what are the, is, is it clear that research is saying, you know, absolutely no alcohol at all? Or are there some gradations that we should be aware of? Yeah. So I would never want to tell anybody, any woman not to drink alcohol because there are studies that show, you know, um, moderate, minimal, moderate levels of alcohol is on occasion is okay. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're seeing is that women are not drinking that way as much as they used to. They are drinking he heavier, um, uh, greater amounts of alcohol that sort of uh, are trending toward the, you know, the problematic types of alcohol use. Mm -hmm. And and what are the differences between men and women in terms of, you know, um, how our bodies process alcohol and what the amount of alcohol that it's considered uh, a minimal amount versus a excessive amount? Yeah, well, you're the doctor, but <laughs> <laughs> what I know or read is that um, women absorb alcohol differently. Mm -hmm. than men and it has a more negative effect even even controlling for weight and women's hormones can influence the absorption of alcohol so what might be okay one week is not necessarily going to be okay or have the same effect the next week and so to just mm -hmm. tell somebody okay you can only have one to two drinks three times a week or whatever I wouldn't want to say, okay, that's okay for the rest of your life. I mean, th there's aging, there's other health conditions that can play a role as well. Yeah. So in other words, there's been more, more research done on men in terms of what defines a safe drink, whereas for women, because of hormonal fluctuations, age, et cetera, it's unclear exactly, right, is, is one thing that you're saying. And, and um women's bodies, you said, I'm the doctor, so I'll throw this in. <laughs> so we have a, a, a um, an enzyme in our stomach that helps to break down alcohol, the, you know, as we drink it. And men have more of that enzyme statistically than, than women do. And so they break down alcohol more quickly in their body. And so become intoxicated at a slower rate than women do. That's another difference as well. Um, so are there specific triggers or pressures that women that have been influencing women's drinking patterns over time? I mean, we mentioned the pandemic, but there, are there others? Yeah, um, definitely the stress of managing a work life and a family life. So mm -hmm. I think we all know that men have not caught up to women in terms of doing housework and doing childcare. And even during the pandemic, women who were working from the home still did the majority of the housework and the childcare, even when her husband or partner was there as well. And so studies have shown, including my own research, that the more stressed out basically um, a mom is, uh, the more likely that she will drink alcohol. And with COVID, the more likely that she will have increased her alcohol since COVID, her alcohol consumption. Mm -hmm the higher the stress on her uh, because of her work and family. Yeah. And you mentioned childcare. There's also, you know, the, the sandwich generation phenomena of taking care of your children at the same time as you're taking care maybe of aging parents as well. And that's, I think, another, another stressor that women uh, become caregivers at a greater rate than men. Not to say men don't, of course they do, but just the numbers and the, the tendency is for that to fall on women in most families. Um, so how would you define, you know, a lot of people say, uh, and, and you mentioned, you know, a drink here and there. How do you define a social drinker? Because I, mm -hmm. I, I think your book talked a little bit about, you know, what is social drinking? Right. So I interviewed 32 women about these concepts. So what is an alcoholic? What is 
what is a binge drinker? What is a social drinker? And mm-hmm. they had these themes in common. So a social drinker, you drink occasionally, you drink one or two, you drink out with friends, never alone. Uh, it's not the main focus of the activity and it's not a problem. Mm-hmm. But when I looked at the data that the women provided about their own drinking habits, about 50% had, um, uh, based on this criteria, evidence of a mild to moderate uh, uh, alcohol use disorder. So that mm-hmm. they checked some of those items on, you know, did you ever try to stop drinking, but found that you could, is mm-hmm. drinking getting in the way of your uh, family relationships or your work? Do you feel mm-hmm. hungover? Like those sorts of criteria. So mm-hmm. everyone thinks they're a social drinker. They all describe themselves as social drinkers. Yeah. But the data suggests otherwise. And I think that's probably the case on a broader level. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, that that's a really important principle, which you bring up in terms of the questions that you ask, because any substance um, that um, where it imp- impedes your ability to function and your relationships really is is what defines that you have a disorder. So whether that's food right? If you, if you're eating to the point where it's making you sick and what you're eating is making you sick, or if it's alcohol, or if it's nicotine, um, or, or, uh, opioids, you know, whatever it is, if your use of it is making you impaired in some way in your relationships, your work, your home life, then that that's when you really have to stop and say, Hey, wait a minute. Um, this isn't really working for me. Correct. And if you think about family life, so I study families, um, a quarter of all uh, families with children are single mothers. And so then you think about, you know, wow, um, women using alcohol to manage stress, which is higher among single moms. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what I found too, is that single mothers in particular had a lot of mitigating strategies to minimize Mm -hmm. the harm. So they would drink only after their kids were put to bed or only Mm -hmm. out with friends and never at home. Um, And so I'm still seeing mothers putting their children ahead of their drinking, at least in the sample that I interviewed. So that's good news. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, um, so one of the areas of research cited in your book that was that women who feel discriminated against are more likely to consume alcohol. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So um, there, there are significant racial and ethnic differences in alcohol consumption with white women, especially midlife and older white women drinking the most alcohol and much less alcohol consumption among African-Americans and Asians and Hispanics, with the only group being similar to whites being um, Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, I forgot your question. What was it? Well, I just wanted you to expand on, you said that that women who feel discriminated against oh. are more likely to consume alcohol. I wanted you to expound uh, on that. Yeah, and so studies of um, African-Americans in particular those women who said they felt discriminated against or um, experienced microaggressions, like they felt uncomfortable in a situation or they weren't treated fairly, those women had higher levels of alcohol consumption, controlling for other factors like their age and their income and things like that. And incidentally, um, the LGBTQ plus population also has higher levels of alcohol consumption kind of at baseline, but that same effect of microaggressions you see in that mm-hmm. population as well. And it kind of makes sense based upon what we talked about before that, you know, when you feel under stress, a lot of times the, the association has been made that, well, if I feel stressed, that's the time when I should have a drink because it'll help calm me down. It'll help me sleep. It'll help my anxiety. It'll help me cope better. And, um, you know, unfortunately, that's that's the association that's been made. But I know specifically with sleep, it actually disrupts sleep. That's, I think, a pretty common myth that uh, I probably should do a debunk on one day. Right. But um, (laughs) but yeah. And and so that's that's not a surprise. Um, You also noted, though, that 
uh, deaths due to alcohol have increased by 130%, which blew me away for white women, but it's actually decreased by 27% for black women. What would you attribute that to? Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, well, the results don't control for level of education. So in some other research I've done, once you control for that, you see that African-American women who have a bachelor's degree or higher have about the same levels of drinking as do white women with a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, so I can't necessarily pick apart the, the decline for amongst African-Americans and other uh, people of color, because as you mentioned earlier, their levels of education are going up. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I don't have the answer to that question. I, I do know that, you know, there are lots of stereotypes of poor women, women of color as drinking, doing drugs, and they have much level, lower levels of alcohol consumption um, than other women. And so it's, I think that's Which interesting. Yeah. Like that goes happen there. <laughs> exactly. Which I think is important because it goes, the research goes against the stereotype, which is very key, I think. And one other thing that I just heard you say is that when you're under stress, uh, you know, the, the, the income level and the educational level correlate more than, than race does. Mm -hmm. is the other thing that I heard you say. Um, but it seems like there are probably some protective factors in the African-American community and the Hispanic community that are protecting against death due to alcohol. So that would be, I think, probably a fascinating next area of research. Absolutely. I would love to do something like that because um, in, in, white middle-class America that focuses so on the nuclear family and not asking for help and extended family members not living near you or that you're not supposed to, you know, or you don't grow up with a strong extended family network. And then where do you go for help when you're mm -hmm. in having a meltdown because your kid is screaming and you've got yeah. work, things at work do, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. And I, and I think too, though, that, um, you know, there's been a lot of research done around a concept of weathering, meaning awesome. that, you know, for black and Hispanic and, and Native American people of color, that the impacts of, of racism um, uh, really sort of provide this, this wear and tear on your body over time. It's like, you know, water dripping on stone, just sort of wearing it down. And that's the effect of these microaggressions over time, but that um, they specifically looked at uh, doc Dr. Geronimus, who's famous for doing this weathering uh, research, looked at Hispanic communities that were more recent immigrants to this country who had um, stronger uh, familial networks and found that that was a protective factor. Um, so I think what you're alluding to maybe is that for some groups, uh, who have stronger, um, uh, you know, familial bonds or community bonds or maybe religious bonds that that might be a protective factor. But I think it's it would be interesting to really kind of tease it out um, by ethnicity, by socioeconomics, et cetera. So, yeah, um, you did mention, um, religion and in my research, I have found in others that um, people who are Catholic, for example, drink less, and the more mm -hmm. you are involved in, you know, going to church, less alcohol use as well. So, yeah. So, you know, I, I always like to um, make sure that our listeners, you know, if if a particular topic pertains to them or a family member, um, and and they think that, hey, maybe perhaps my drinking might fall into this category. What do I do? What, what would you say um, are some immediate options that people might be able to, to take advantage of if they're concerned about yeah. the, their level of drinking? Yeah, I think, um, unfortunately, as you mentioned, our healthcare system <laughs> is not a guarantee for um, health, especially when it comes to using substances and mental health and things like that. 
Um, I think trusting your own instincts about your, your own drinking and those around you uh, can be really helpful and try as opposed to like trying to count their number of drinks and putting up them up against a, some kind of, you know, guidelines um, uh, instead looking at the way that you're feeling, the way they're feeling, the family situation, things like that. Um, uh, I'm not sure that most, I don't, you could say, you could tell me about the training that most like primary care doctors get. If someone should mm -hmm. present and say, I think I'm drinking too much. I mean, yeah. their options are AA or yeah. rehab, you know, what is that? Mm -hmm. So, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, so AA.org is a great place to start. Um, there's also recently the 988 number that has been implemented as an emergency number for people with mental health and substance use concerns. Um, and so dialing 988, talking to somebody about where in your specific um, area are resources. Um, and then also, lastly, you mentioned your primary care doctor, another great uh, research resource rather for having that conversation, helping you figure out is my alcohol consumption harming my body um, in ways that I might not yet feel? There are tests that can be done. And also that doctor might be able to put you in touch with uh, resources around helping you to cut down or eliminate uh, drinking altogether. So, Yeah, you mentioned um, cutting down. So um, there's a moderation movement underway. And I think there are um, lots of TikTokers and Facebook groups Mm -hmm. moderation management, sober sisters, like people who just um, are interested in reducing their alcohol consumption or kind mm -hmm. of the harm reduction way of dealing with alcohol as opposed to you're just never going to drink again, which I think is very right. scary for some people. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and I think, you know, social media has been providing ways for people to form communities around just about everything. <laughs> so I think you're absolutely right in terms of that support um, and people coming out and talking about their drinking on TikTok. I think that's been pretty huge. So, wow, I have a bunch more questions for you, but I think it's time to go to the audience and see what's in the chat. Hey, Wayne, are you there? I'm here, I'm supportive. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask all the supportive things. I want to thank uh, the doctor for joining us this evening. So here we are. We're going to kick things off. Um, Tracy Walls asks, does alcohol affect women differently, i.e. women who have given birth versus those who have never given birth? Good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't heard anything along those lines. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you also mentioned, I, I don't think that uh, that whether you've given birth or not makes a difference, but I think earlier you mentioned that your body's um, ability to process alcohol also depends on your hormo hormonal levels at the time. So you, the, the time in your cycle when you drink, when you are ingesting alcohol. Okay. Yeah, correct. Uh, Valerie Spalding Parker comes in and says, what about wine versus hard liquor? Have you seen any difference? One, how it affects the body and how, what women drink, I guess, what women drink more. Women drink, uh, their drink of choice is wine. So if you asked a sample of women, what's your go-to, they, two thirds of them would say wine. Okay. Um, but I don't know if the kind of alcohol matters. Um, Dr. Mill? Did, yeah. Have you heard any I think, I think most of the studies have been done around wine. Um, and there's, there are not as many studies, as you mentioned before, on the effects of different kinds of alcohol in women versus men. Um, the one, the, the studies on wine sort of differentiate between white wine and red wine. And there's a question about whether the resveratrol, which is the uh, which is found in the skin of the grape actually has some protective effect. Um, 
and and you know in in small quantities i think that's important to to mention um but i think most of the research has been done around wine versus other harder liquors but keep in keep in mind that there's um the if you just look at the alcohol content um that you know if you have a small amount of tequila or scotch or um uh, bourbon uh as hard liquors that that you know there is a correlation based upon the amount of 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 alcohol that you have the alcohol content of the drink is what you can compare across uh you know whether it's hard liquor or wine okay. uh we also have a question what about the breakdown on underage drinking uh, I, I can speak to generational differences in drinking. So this increase in, in alcohol consumption has occurred among older women, women at midlife and beyond. Younger generations like Gen Z, they're drinking less alcohol than my generation did at their age. Um, they're doing a lot of things less. They're they're having sex less, they're driving less, and they're drinking less alcohol, too. <laughs> and so, what, what about weed, though? <laughs> well, <laughs> that I don't know. <laughs> uh, so uh, they're watching more video games and videos, and yeah. they seem more interested in um, computers than yeah. alcohol and sex. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And driving. You said and driving, driving, too. And driving and driving. Yeah. Uh, how do you think men can help curb women? Women's has there been any study on whether men helping not drinking or talking? How can men give a hand? Yeah. So that's really important because um, women are often in relationships, and it's interesting because um, women's drinking tends to match that of their partner. So if their husband drinks a lot, then they will drink more than the average woman who doesn't have a husband who might drink a lot. Um, I think that, um, that, that shame is bad. <laughs> like trying to say, oh, you're, you know, you're an awful person. How could you do this? Um, what about the kids? Like, I don't think that's helpful as much as you know, being a support person, like, what can I do? It sounds like you want to reduce your drinking. How can I help you with that? I guess one, one, one thing is men have to realize if they're over drinking themselves. So, mm -hmm. so if you have a problem, you're not necessarily going to want to help your partner because you don't realize you don't think they have a, a problem. And you don't realize your own problem. Right. right. And sometimes for women, they'll be feeling like they're drinking too much, but the people all around them, they don't see a problem with it because they're all drinkers too. Mm -hmm. Birds of a feather. Is that the birds of a feather count? So we have another question. This is from, I can't pronounce the name. I'm sorry. <laughs> Give me some name. What about women who have had an alcoholic family member? Do they seem to drink more? Uh, yes, studies do show that um, there is a pre, uh, you know, a, a genetic predisposition toward um, drinking if you have a family member with that, you know, in your history. Um, but also, if you, it, it's a, it can be a socialization process as well. So, um, if if your parents are heavy drinkers, then you'd be more likely to be a heavy drinker as well. But even if they're not, I mean, you might want to ask your, you know, about your parents. You know, it was my grandfather a drinker, and you know, try to get into some of those family secrets sometimes that people keep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's important too. I mean, health histories of your family, and like you said, generations before us sometimes are not the sort of the the code around what's private was much higher bar than it is for subsequent generations and um you know when you ask it might be to ask you know and so that you say you know i i really want this information so it can help me out um 
So not trying to violate anybody's privacy, but trying to understand my own self and what I might be at risk for. Right. I think that's important. So we have a question that I'm going to ask anyway from Mar Mario James Frazier. Does weight play a part in becoming inebriated? I know what you're going to say. I, I know what I think. And if so, what is the recommended consumption weight based on weight? They, they, they won't have a recommended consumption rate, Mario. They, they're not <laughs> going to answer that question, but I asked it just to say your name. But <laughs> for men versus women. Go ahead. Well, that, thank you, Mario, for the question. But go ahead, Dr. Stewart. Oh, gosh. Well, I think in general, uh, smaller people should consume smaller amounts of alcohol. You know, uh, I wouldn't want to see a 110 pound woman, um, you know, drinking five beers, you know, that maybe a 250 pound man would be drinking. I think it would probably have a, a different effect on her than, than him. Mm -hmm. Right. But also too, I mean, I think regardless of weight, there's a recommended, um, number of drinks, recommended drinks that you not exceed per day. Um, and, and I think it's five ounces uh, is considered a standard drink. So one to two for women and two to three for men. Um, mm -hmm. Typically are the recommendations. I don't think it's done per se by weight, um, but either, either way that the, the potential effects on your body that Dr. Stewart ran down the more alcohol that you're exposed to, the higher your risk for liver disease, for cancers, um, uh, for heart disease, for rapid heart rate. A lot of people uh, I know as they age become more susceptible to that rapid heart rate and uh, when, they, when they do drink. Disruptions in sleep, we talked about that before, and also weight gain. So if you're already overweight, drinking more because you think that you can handle it probably isn't going to help either. And if you have a big belly, doesn't mean you have more enzymes in the big belly. <laughs> just yeah. doesn't work that way. <laughs> Your body's a fine tune machine <laughs> at any weight. Uh, when you stayed at a holiday inn last night, right? I stayed at a holiday inn <laughs> last night, but uh, I just don't think, I mean, I had a big belly. It didn't affect whether I could bring down alcohol. I mean, just didn't. <laughs> uh, if you, uh, another question, if you drink at dinner for four to six ounces a day, is that a problem? A drink at dinner, four to six ounces a day, is that a problem? I don't think that would typically be viewed as a problem. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, we, we kind of talked about de defining um, sort of, is it, is it impairing you in some way? If it's affecting your sleep, then yeah. If it is causing you to have heartburn when you get ready to go to bed, then yeah, that's a problem. Um, so you have to sort of look at how it's affecting uh, you in your, in your life. Um, I think there are a number of studies that show, you know, like I said, five ounces is considered standard, um, that one drink a day, uh, you know, doesn't cause major problems, but then there are also other studies that show that no amount of alcohol is safe. So, um, again, you kind of have to decide based upon the effect that it's having on you, your function and your health. There we go. And there you have it. Yeah. So Dr. Dr. any Dr. other questions? That's it, Dr. Mill. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. Uh, this was really informative. Um, I think a lot of us, uh, you know, have seen the trends with, with the marketing to women and wondered, you know, is this really good? And I think we've kind of answered it tonight, but it's not. And that we need to be concerned about our health and the health effects of how alcohol is affecting us in our lives. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, of course, Wayne, for uh, bringing the word from the street and for being supportive and wearing your supportive hoodie. We, we appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. For the, those good questions. And then, of course, before I go, I want you all to remember um, that you just by listening to the show are eligible to support 
to participate in a special research study that's being conducted by Howard University. They've asked me to invite people that listen to the show to participate in the COVID resilience research study. Participation is voluntary, but if you just fill out two surveys, it takes about 15 to 25 minutes. If you fill out those two surveys, you can be compensated $100 just for doing that. So if you have any interest, please uh, reach out to Dana Harvey. And her email is danaharveyresearch at gmail.com. That's Dana, D-A-N-A, Harvey, H-A-R-V-E-Y, research at gmail.com. Well, that is it for us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again tonight on Excuse Me, Doctor. Thank you again to my guest, Dr. Susan Stewart. Thank you to the audience for those fantastic questions. And until I see you, have a powerful week and be wise, be well, and be health empowered. So I guess I should thank the Robinsons. They invited me. They still don't know. I hooked up with Dave three days ago. He'll start coughing tomorrow. And I bet in 10 days he'll be on a ventilator. Now his wife, she's not vaccinated because she thinks it'll prevent her from being pregnant. But what they don't know is, is that I can decrease sperm count. Sorry, Dave. Good luck with that.